one one minute. This is starting mm -hmm. the streaming. Okay. So I cannot fool around anymore after this. <laughs> okay, now we are on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So we we can start. Uh, well, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, Professor Kentaro Nagamine in this new uh, Imparco seminar. Uh, Kentaro is a, a professor now in the Osaka University, working uh, mainly in galaxy formation and evolution using uh, simulations. Uh, he did uh, his PhD in the Princeton University under the supervision of Jeremy Ostreicher, and he presented the PhD in 2001. And after that, uh, moved to several uh, postdoctoral positions in the United States, first in Harvard, later on in the UC San Diego. And finally, he moved as a researcher in the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, and also collaborated and worked in several uh, uh, institutions in, uh, in Japan. And, 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 and currently, is uh, uh, doing his research mainly based on the on Osaka University, but uh, I, I saw in your CV that you are still uh, working in Las Vegas and also in, in uh, several other institutions in, in Japan, if I am not wrong. Uh, and well, as I said, uh, Kentaro has a broad experience on studying galaxy formation, using, uh, mainly using uh, uh, cosmological zooming simulations, but also he focused on how different flavors on, of their matter uh, introduce changes on these simulations, also in uh, studying the formation of supermassive black holes on the gas in the CGM and, and in the IGM and how the feedback affects the formation of galaxies. So he uh, has a broad experience on, on galaxy formation. And today uh, he will talk us uh, just about that, how metals and dust uh, form and the, the consequences of this, uh, the distribution of this uh, dust and metals in the gas in hydrogen aerogal simulations. So, Thank you a lot, uh, Kentaro. Please, if I missed something from your CV, of course I missed many things from your no, CV. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Nanti. Uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, I'm Ken Aramine from Osaka. And uh, over here, it's in the evening. Right now it's uh, 6 p.m. And uh, your morning over here, over there, right? So good morning to you all. And uh, thanks for this opportunity to uh, present you some of my recent work uh, with my collaborators. And uh, uh, I will tell you about the metals and dust in uh, cosmology. And uh, the movie you see here is actually uh, within the collaboration called the Agora co Collaboration that uh, Santi and I are working on. And it's one of the zoom-in simulations that we've been producing over the years. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more later, okay? All right, so uh, uh, let's start. And you can interrupt me anytime uh, during my seminar. And I heard that there are many students as well. so. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, welcome the questions. Um, the goal uh, of my research is fairly simple in a short sentence. Uh, we, we like to test the structure formation in the Lambda CDM paradigm, which has become certain with from the various uh, cosmological probes, uh, including CMB, cosmic microwave background. And uh, uh, we like, we can do this uh, through the distribution of metals and dust in galaxies and uh, circumgalactic medium, the CGM you see there is a circumgalactic medium, and IGM is an intergalactic medium. And as you study this more and more, uh, you, you realize that the uh, uh, important physical processes are the star formation and feedback in particular. And I'll tell you what feedback means later uh, more in detail. And uh, through the simulation that can study the nonlinear evolution of these galaxies, uh, we came to learn that the multi-phase inflow and outflow are quite important in the growth and evolution of galaxies. And uh, recent observations, uh, multi-wavelength observations, are very useful to learn about uh, when and how the first galaxies are forming and uh, have formed, and uh, uh, in particular, ALMA uh, is giving us good insight on, on high redshift galaxies uh, through the observation of fine and fred metal lines. Um, so uh, I will tell you a bit about that, uh, our recent work. And if I have time at the second part, I think I, I, I can spend maybe 15 minutes or so in the latter part and talk about the treatment of uh, dynamical uh, dust formation and destruction in hydro simulations, because this is one of the aspects that's important for observation as well, when you try to connect it to each other. Okay. So you've, I'm sure you've seen this uh, diagram somewhere before. It's the cosmic history. 
uh, in within Lambda City and Paradigm. Eh, ¿Te puedo llamar yo en un, en un poquito, en, en una hora? Muy bien, sí. Y so a so Big Bang on the left and uh, present time on the right. And uh, your universe started from Big Bang and uh, uh, after uh, uh, 400,000 years, recombination occurred. And there was a neutral epoch called Dark Age for a while. And then around Redshift uh, 30, 20, the first stars turns on. And the first galaxies, now we think, formed around Reshi 15 or so. And those sources, the first sources uh, start to emit the ionizing photons around, the, uh, around those galaxies, sources, and uh, start to uh, ionize the medium around it, forming a, a bubble of H2 regions. And those bubbles eventually percolate. And uh, we know from the observation of quasar absorption lines that this ionization process uh, finished uh, by Reshi 6 or so. And that's about 1 billion years as you see here, one billion years after the Big Bang, okay? And thereafter, the universe is almost uh, ionized and there are neutral gas pockets, but uh, galaxy evolution took place and then reached to the present day. Okay? So in the present day, we have very good galaxy surveys like a Sloan Distal Sky Survey, 2D, 2D Reef Field Research Survey, right? Those are the, there was a revol revolution of the galaxy surveys uh, using CCDs. And now we're trying to expand that to Redshift 1 to 2 using uh, these uh, last large uh, uh, galaxy surveys. And in particular in Japan, using Svaro Telescope, we've been doing this hyper supreme cam survey, HSC survey at Redshift, it's intermediate at Redshift galaxy imaging. And now we're trying to make transition to a multi-object spectrograph using so-called PFS, prime focus spectrograph. And that will come in about two years or so. There's also similar projects like DES, Desi, Moons, Euclid, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So these can be regarded as a, a Sloan survey at Redshift 1 to 2, uh, producing lots of data in the, in, the, in the very near future. So this will be one uh, uh, frontier in the near future for galaxy evolution. And also uh, this uh, first galaxy epoch is still very interesting, uh, uh, marking the transition of galaxy of the universe from you know, early universe to the present you know, structure formation dominated universe. So that will be also probed by JLVST very soon, in a few years. Uh, ELT, TMT, GMT, large, large telescopes. And uh, in the future, 21 centimeter surveys by SKA is also going to do tomography of these uh, uh, reionization epochs. So, so we, we, we try to focus on these two epochs roughly and try to delineate the galaxy evolution over cosmic time. Okay, So that's the global picture. And as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of interesting sources being discovered through multi-wavelength, uh, UV, infrared, lime and alpha, middle lines. And in particular, the uh, higher redshift is interesting to study, uh, marking these transitions. So here are some examples of interesting sources, O3, lime and alpha emitters above redshift seven. Uh, the past few years, we have discovered some of these uh, very interesting sources at high Z above redshift seven. Uh, here's Lyman and Brake galaxy and submillimeter galaxy as well also discovered that these epochs harboring a uh, very massive supermassive black hole uh, above 10 to the 9 solar masses. So there are many other examples of uh, galaxies above redshift uh, 7 and uh, uh, ALMA in particular is, is uh, uh, producing lots of interesting data on, uh, on these uh, IZ galaxies. And one object I would like to highlight is uh, uh, this uh, Hashimoto paper, which was a Nature article uh, two years ago, uh, detected this O3 88 micron emission line at redshift 9.1. So this is one of the highest redshift galaxy that's ever been discovered by you know, a, a fairly certain uh, a particular line, not just ambiguous line of uh, tentative detection. And what's interesting is that uh, um, uh, in addition to these lines, uh, they were able to look at this Balmer break. So that Balmer break suggested the age of a uh, few hundred million years, uh, which means that this particular galaxy, galaxy formation started already at Reshi 15, having a star formation rate about 10 solar masses per year. And with uh, some assumptions on the magnification, it may ha ha already have 10 to the 9 solar mass of stars. Uh, at Redshift 9, and this is one of the sources that can easily be, be detectable uh, by JLVST, so obvious candidate for the first um, uh, 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 
for a survey or by JWST to look at. Okay. So uh, these are uh, um, you know a good example of uh, high Z high Z galaxy formation already at RSA 15 happening. Okay. And there are many interesting physical processes taking place um, in these sources. So uh, this is this is what it makes interesting also in terms of uh, studying uh, uh, interstellar gas as well. So in these sources, uh, we we know from simulations that uh, the cold gas flows in to this uh, dark matter halo through uh, some people call cold flow, cold accretion, uh, cold filament, and that's the gas of the 10 to the 4 Kelvin. And within that gas, uh, colder clouds of uh, 100 Kelvin, 1000 Kelvin may form through thermal instability, and that will eventually turn into stars. So the star formation takes place, and the H2 region, H2 bubble forms around it, uh, ionizing the gas. And so the oxygen will also be ionized and within this gas of 10 to the 5 Kelvin or so, uh, emitting the oxygen 3 line that I just showed, uh, detected by ALMA. Okay. Um, UV light will come out from this bubble and then uh, impinge on this uh, nearby interstellar gas. And those on the surfaces of this uh, nearby gas, uh, the, there'll be PDR region. And that PDR region will emit uh, C plus uh, line. That, that's a C2 line that's also observed by ALMA. Uh, if there is dust, um, that's, that's why dust becomes important. Dust will absorb this UV photon and absorb and re-emit in the infrared. So there'll be further infrared continuum emission as well. So uh, that's also an important source of energy to look at. Um, Lyman alpha photon is going to be scattered. So that's a, a difficult part of uh, studying this source, but uh, uh, in this neutral hydrogen dusty gas, it, it will be absorbed and also scattered and then it will come out. So in Lyman alpha is also another strong line that's observed in these high Z sources. And the supernova, as it uh, explodes, the, there'll be gas outflows uh, coming out from these high Z galaxies. And that's also one of the uh, physical process that's interesting and we focus on uh, theoretically to study as well. So these are the sort of processes involved and we try to uh, account for these processes as much as possible from first principles and uh, try to understand these systems. So this is the same movie that I showed earlier in the beginning on the title. Uh, you see these cold filamentary flows uh, occurring uh, along these uh, thin filaments. Uh, stop, this is stopped at redshift two, but if I can draw on this, uh, you see this uh, 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 cold filaments flowing into the central halo like this. And so there's a central halo in the bit in the middle. And then uh, as these uh, uh, filament uh, feeds the uh, 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 fuel for so star formation, there's a lot of uh, star formation occurring. And as the star formation takes place, you see these hot bubbles uh, coming out in between those uh, cold filaments. So there's a channels of uh, low density region that uh, promotes the uh, hot gas outflow in between these cold channels. So this is the hot bubble it will also carry the metals together and uh, that's how the chemical enrichment within the silicon galactic uh, environment and also intergalactic environment occurs. Okay, so here's the same system looked in terms of metallicity. Those outflows carry the metals. So uh, the metals are carried out uh, together with these hot bubbles uh, in these, uh, um, in between those, uh, like a chimney and going out up to a few hundred kiloparsec scales easily and also possibly to intergalactic space as well. So viewing this uh, uh, movie, you can easily believe that the metals are you know, transferred out into the inter intergalactic space uh, through these uh, super, supernova uh, feedback. This is a supernova feedback okay, in terms of both energy and uh, kinematics. So that's the two processes that we need to uh, model in a simulation, not just a the thermal energy dump and thermal energy eventually will uh, disperse and then turn into kinetic energy and then the momentum is applied. And in this particular simulation, we don't do the radiation transfer. So therefore the radiation pressure is not applied to the gas, but that's another thing that we will eventually want to do through radiation hydrodynamics. Uh, but in this particular case, we don't do the, we don't have the radiation transfer yet. We post process through with radiation. Okay. 
And this is a general picture uh, that we have now um, through these simulations and uh, uh, trying to compare with various observations, including quasar absorption line galaxies themselves, and trying to learn how strong these feedback effects is and uh, how they suppress in turn the star formation and self-regulate its own growth. And that self-regulation is the difficult part to model. And there are many previous works. Um, here are just uh, a few examples of those. Um, if, you, if you want to look further into these uh, previous studies, we, for example, looked at with my collaborator, Hiri Ajima. We tried to look at quasar host like regions, over dense regions, five sigma over dense regions that may host a supermassive black hole at ratio six. So we looked at this type of dense regions. And um, we also computed the submillimeter flux from these uh, uh, sources. And although it's a tip of the iceberg, uh, we were able to show that the, these sources can be observed by ALMA. Um, and it is being observed now. Um, uh, Zhao Chen Ma also looked at less massive galaxies and showed that the escape fraction of ionizing photons fluctuates very rapidly on a few mega year time scale. So these objects are not at all steady uh, emitters, um, this uh, emission uh, quite uh, is sporadic and intermittent. So that's another feature of high-Z galaxies. Um, we've also looked at submillimeter galaxies and uh, using Ramses AMR simulations, CATS also looked at a lot of metal line emitters, uh, just like we did using zooming simulations and resolved the details of ISM structure using different mines. And as I will show you similar work later here. So in our case, uh, we post-process uh, these simulations with uh, radiation transfer code called ART2. Uh, it's the acronym of the All Wavelength Radiated Transfer with Adaptive Refinement Tree. And originally developed by Yushin Li uh, in uh, uh, Penn State, uh, but Hide Yajima worked with, her, with them and uh, kind of expanded this code to include the transfer of um, Lamin alpha and uh, treatment for dust absorption re-emission, assuming a constant uh, dust to metal ratio. So that's the still limitation, but at least it allows us to post-process process, uh, considering the impact of dust absorption re-emission as well. So we first uh, solve the transfer of ionizing photons from the star formation uh, that occurs in, star, in, in a simulation, and we solve for the uh, uh, propagation of this ionization. So we solve the ionization equilibrium first, and obtain the ionization within this uh, simulated gas, uh, uh, calculate UV continuum, uh, dust absorption re-emission from these sources, and then consider also other lines if you like, like line and alpha. The nice thing about this is that uh, uh, we can actually lay down this adaptive mesh onto the uh, native SPH uh, structure. And SPH, for those uh, students who don't know what SPH is, it's a smooth particle hydrodynamics, and uh, it represents this hydro element, fluid element by a cloud of particle. The, the particle represents a, a cloud of gas and this particle moves around. So uh, it's Lagrangian by its own nature. So as the galaxy form, the material uh, come together into the galactic halo. So the gas particle also moves around in a Lagrangian fashion. So the resolution element kind of gathers into these interesting regions Therefore, we have more resolution element in high density region. So that's why we don't want to lose that uh, native SPH uh, distribution. And that's why we want to lay down the adaptive refinement grid so that we don't lose the resolution when we do the uh, radiation transfer on this uh, gas distribution, okay? So we did this and then calculated different aspects. Uh, so here's one example of such relative six uh, galaxy. Here you see this up top left the gas distribution, very chaotic and turbulent uh, distribution of uh, gas. And there are two kind of merging galaxy to, or if you include these guys, there, there are several merging galaxies uh, along the filamentary region like this. And there's one big one over here. Eventually they will merge. The metals, you see a bubble-like feature. This is probably due to the outflow. There's a gas central galaxy here that is producing this outflow-like bubble feature, right? So there's a dust distribution based on the metal distribution in this run. Uh, there's a UV photon that's emitted by these stars and uh, post-process submillimeter emission on, on the bottom right. 
We also can compute the ten dust temperature based on this equilibrium calculation of radiation and also the cool heating and cooling. In fact, the interesting part is that the, the dust temperature is a bit higher uh, than the lower redshift observation. So that in our case, the central part is, is, becomes like a 60 Kelvin uh, higher than the lower redshift uh, observation, which suggests lower 30 Kelvin temperatures. So high Z galaxies may have higher dust temperature. Okay. Um, so, so as uh, other people have shown, we first saw that the star formation, star formation history is sporadic in these systems. So this is a history from redshift 15 to redshift six, uh, top panel star formation rate, uh, going up to you know, 10 solar masses per year, um, as shown by the ALMA source I explained earlier, is this a very similar uh, system. So in the beginning, it's very sporadic, but as the halos grow and massive become massive, it starts to have continuous star formation and it, it goes into the settling phase uh, as it gets closer to rest of six. Okay. So you have this, uh, this uh, on the right is a kind of schematic picture. You have, you have an infalling gas and dust. And as the central star burst occurs, like in one of these bursts, um, that will also uh, uh, produce the outflow. So the, uh, in the outflowing phase, in this in between these uh, phases, uh, the gas is flowing out and uh, gas and dust is ejected into the, into the CGM environment. And the central density of the gas also fluctuates at the same time in a similar fashion correlated with these uh, star formation rate bursts. Okay. And if you translate that into SED, uh, thanks to this acceleration transfer calculation, we can translate that information energetics into the SED, the spectral energy distribution. And this shows this uh, evolution of SED from redshift 15 to redshift six. You see how it kind of oscillates. And depending on which phase you are in, the UV is sometimes higher. And if it's dust obscured, gas shrouded phase, it, the, the infrared peak actually wins over the So it kind of fluctuates back and forth on a very short time scale. So uh, it, it's not at all a static, static object. Okay. And in addition to this uh, calculation of continuum, uh, we wanted to compare to the ALMA observation. So we uh, added a metal emission line calculation. By the way, this Arata, he was a previous uh, PhD student. He, uh, he graduated uh, last year, so he's no longer here, but uh, he did this uh, as a PhD thesis work. And so he added a, a module that calculates this uh, uh, detailed uh, level balance of this oxygen ionization and carbon ionization. So he computed this oxygen 88 micron and carbon two uh, luminosity with parsec scale ionization structure. Okay. Uh, in these simulations, I didn't say uh, detail, but uh, the um, physical spatial resolution, because it's higher redshift and that works in advantage for us, but the spatial resolution is on the order of uh, um, a few parsec to 10 parsec level, because there's one plus Z effect. Uh, in the physical sense, it, it can go down to that resolution of 10 parsec scale, okay? Um, so here's the, again, the chaotic nature of this uh, uh, high Z galaxies, uh, turbulent, and the luminosity we obtained through this calculation is as, as much as 10 to the 42 herbs per second, which is similar to the observed system. So this one already has stellar mass of 10 to the nine solar mass, uh, gas mass of 10 to the 10, and uh, dust mass of uh, 10 to the seven solar masses also. Fairly uh, massive system at rest of six and seven, um, similar to the uh, object that's observed by ALMA. Okay. All right, and uh, one interesting thing that uh, both observers and theorists are suggesting is that offset between this oxygen three line and carbon two line may give us interesting hints. And um, uh, we, we show this example from our simulation uh, to characterize that, but you see this oxygen three line can come out from the hotter region, closer to the star forming region, because though this line comes out from the highly ionized region of 10 to the five, 10 to the six Kelvin. So therefore it's, it's closer to the star forming region. Whereas this C2 line comes out from a bit lower temperature gas, 10 to the four, 10 to the three. 
which may could be partially neutral. So those are along the filamentary structure that still contain cold gas. So uh, the, the photons, ionizing photons may escape perpendicular to these filaments and that may uh, uh, contribute to the reionization, uh, ionizing ionization. Uh, whereas the photons have difficulty going towards in this direction of filaments, um, so they're blocked and uh, they can they can not go out to those directions. So, so this O3 and C2 uh, offset may reveal the ionizing structure uh, if these details can be observed for these sources, uh, which may give us more hints about how the ISM is in high Z. Many other people uh, that I gave here uh, also work on similar topics, so you can look at those papers too. Um, yeah, so here I just say the same thing, that the top is the same self-mention rate, but in, depending on this, which phase you're looking at, the level of oxygen-3 and carbon-2 may change. So uh, oxygen-3 is, is uh, coming out uh, in this uh, starburst phase, because that's, you know, come from ionization, whereas this uh, C2 is more, you know, uh, broadly distributed associated with the colder gas, so they are less affected by these starbursts and they're a more, bit more continuous um, than the oxygen line itself. So that's a, a slight difference we observed uh, in these simulations. And observers are hinting at interesting uh, relation um, and we looked at examining the same uh, relationship of this ratio, line ratio of O3 and the carbon two line is uh, one of the interesting aspects that observers also focus on. And, we saw in our simulation that the high, these galaxies actually travel from this high value to low value as it, as it grows. And uh, one of the interpretation by Cormier was that as it get metal enriched by metals, uh, it travels towards down to the right. And so you can draw this diagram also in terms of metallicity and a similar behavior is observed. And as it get more luminous and more metal rich, the, our sources also move towards the bottom right. And here, these are the observed data points, and we're a bit lower than that, but come a kind of closer region. Okay. And in our case, we, we gave one more example, um, not just a simple enrichment, but uh, we actually saw from our uh, chemical library, in our simulation, we use this uh, uh, chemical evolution library developed by Saito, uh, where he combined all these uh, uh, stellar evolutionary libraries and which can give, uh, for a given IMF, it can, it can predict a different chemical enrichment uh, taking into account the relative contribution of supernova type 2, type 1a, AGB stars. Okay. So give, this library gave us that the carbon uh, enrichment become more enhanced uh, due to AGB stars at later time after 10 to the eight, so, uh, 10 to the eight years. Okay. So this particular line this uh, uh, cyan line over here represents the AGB contribution of, of from, uh, to the carbon, and that enhances the carbon uh, enrichment over oxygen at, after 10 to 8 years. And that shows up over here as oxygen over carbon ratio. Uh, because of that AGB contribution, it declines after 10 to 8 years. And that's maybe one reason that we saw uh, this uh, O to C to ratio going down as you as you go from redshift nine to redshift six, okay? All right, and um, here is uh, another information about the spatial distribution. And that is also giving us interesting um, um, uh, probe of uh, the system. And um, this was uh, one of, uh, was a press release from uh, National Observatory, uh, NAOJ, uh, by Fujimoto 19, this is an observational paper. But he actually stacked uh, many, many objects uh, from HST and also ALMA observation, and then looked at this relative distribution of UV photon shown in blue, and the red is the carbon-2 emission. So if you lay over the carbon-2 emission, you see that this uh, carbon-2 emission is actually more extended than the UV photon in the center observed by HST. So this in is interesting. Uh, suggesting the chemical enrichment beyond the central region of the galaxy. And this is uh, like a four, four arc second uh, uh, region, which is correspond to two, 20 kiloparsec in size. So given uh, uh, projecting that into profile, here's this the flux 
uh, surface uh, brightness, if you say, uh, the flux on the surface as a function of radius. And what they showed, uh, and we also combined the simulation comparison into this paper, and he showed that the data suggested by this ALMA observation, stacked ALMA image, is more extended than the two simulation that we compared to. And we provided our gadget uh, simulation image, which is shown at the bottom. And the top is actually from Althea simulation uh, by the Andrea Ferraro's group, Italian group, using Ramses, I think, yeah? They show more continuous uh, filamentary structure. Uh, there's a central galaxy. You see this more gaseous uh, disk, whereas in our case, it's more, it's more clumpy. This is, these are not different initial condition. So uh, it's by no means uh, not rigorous uh, uh, comparison of the, of the same source uh, at all, like, Agora, like we're doing in Agora's comparison. But just as an example, uh, we took these uh, uh, high Z galaxy rest of six and 6.5, and then both simulations produced a steeper profile of this carbon two, even after the radiation transfer calculation. So we want to understand more about the mechanism of wide carbon enrichment in this early evolution, early in, in the universe, and then what powers emission itself. And there's a lot of intricate um, interplay of inflow, outflow, uh, ionization, et cetera, et cetera. And one uh, follow-up work by Andrea's group was to, to uh, uh, look at the simple 1D uh, cold outflow model. They produced, uh, a uh, very simple one dimensional calculation concerning the net cooling um, of, of the system. And, um, you know, looking at this one dimensional profile, calculating this uh, heating versus cooling uh, balance uh, along this 1D profile, they, they were able to reproduce this uh, observed Fujimoto profile um, depending on different uh, parameter numbers. And uh, you can try to you know, infer this uh, uh, mass loading factor, the, the so-called eta parameter, which is m dot out divided by the self mentioned rate, typically three, uh, circular velocity of you know, 170 kilometers per second, fairly massive system, and the fairly strong outflow rate, 100 solar masses per year, um, and the outflow velocity of you know, several hundred kilometers. And then you, will be able to produce this type of profile as observed. Okay. So in our simulations, maybe the outflow is not strong enough. And um, that's one of the things that we continue to study and uh, Santi knows about, uh, and uh, Daniel also knows what we are finding through Agora comparison. And uh, we realize that maybe in our kind of simulation, uh, outflow is not strong enough. And uh, we may need to uh, study this more and you know, understand, examine more how these uh, strong outflow may come out from these high Z galaxies, okay? All right, so um, that's my former part and uh, we spent 40 minutes. And uh, if, I have, if people have questions I can take now before I move on to this uh, dust part, if, if I can spend another 10, 15 minutes, I can, I'm happy to talk about it. If, I want, if people want me to stop here, I can stop here too. But, uh, yeah, no questions uh, so far? Or I can take I all of it. Couple, can... but I will wait uh, to the end. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. All right, so let me quickly talk about this uh, dynamical dust treatment in hydrosimulations. And this is also a kind of booming uh, work uh, trying to incorporate this into uh, cosmological hydrosimulation. Um, earlier work includes Becky uh, SPA's work concerning different particle types for dust, dust particles. Um, Osman 20 also did this with SPA's plus dust. Um, McKinnon et al. did this in a repo um, uh, simulation, which is a different type of uh, hydro simulation based on gadgetry, but now considers the Voronoi tessellation solving the hydro. Um, uh, and then in our group, we are using gadget 3 SPS code, and uh, we wrote a few papers on this, uh, several also including uh, cosmological simulation. And more recently, an Italian group uh, led by um, Granato also did the zooming simulation, uh, doing similar dust implementation. So let me show uh, a few things, a few few example results that what can be done with these treatment. 
And as I said earlier, to study these high yield sources, the dust uh, is important, right? It, it absorbs the UV photon and emits in infrared. So if you want to understand the thermal uh, emission from these dust, you need to solve the dust. But dust is really also complicated on its own. And uh, so you have to consider these different processes. The first, where are they produced, right? AGB stars, type 2 supernova uh, are some of the obvious uh, sources, they, they consider to form in shocks of these uh, sources. So M dust will go up with this part process. But uh, dust is also uh, can be destroyed by the supernova shock. So in this diffuse phase, the dust mass can actually go down. That's the destruction of the dust particles. And um, um, uh, the interstellar uh, metals can accrete onto these grains. So they actually can grow the dust grains. So that's the grain growth in dense environment with typical time scale of 10 to seven years, the accretion time scale. And that actually promotes the dust mass. Okay? The shattering is another uh, neg uh, negative, uh, well, it's not a negative, but it, it actually uh, conserves the dust mass, but it occurs in diffuse environment with this time scale. So it actually, when the large grains collide, they get shattered into smaller grains. So it actually changes the relative distribution, size distribution of the dust grains. Okay. And the coagulation combines the small grain and also make it into a bigger grain. Okay. So that's the opposite process of uh, making small grains into large grain. So it reverses this uh, shattering process. And then there's also the astration process where the dust grains are absorbed into stars. They are actually taken into stars and been locked. Okay? Um, sputtering is a, a kind of evaporation of dust. They, the dust can also be uh, sputtered and then uh, destroyed uh, through uh, uh, electrons and impinging onto the dust surface and they can be destroyed. Okay? So um, these were studied in detail uh, in one of the PhD thesis at Nagoya University, uh, a guy called Asano uh, studied this in very detail, uh, wrote down all the 1D equations that can solve these processes in the whole framework. And uh, we are basing on that work, uh, our work on that, on that detailed work. But we found that uh, uh, it can be simplified. And uh, Hiro Hiroshita is one of my collaborators. He's a, a professor in uh, Academia Sinica in Taiwan, and he's the dust guru. And uh, he, he wrote down this uh, very simple two component approximation. You don't have to consider all this very detailed dust grain growth along this fine bin, but you can actually simplify this into only two bins, small grain, large grain. Why don't we just forget all the complicated things and just model this in small grain, large grain, and only two bins. And if you have these two bins, you can keep track of this uh, dust mass in small grains and dust mass in large grains over here. And then uh, write down a uh, very similar equation like the closed box, you know, galaxy evolution model, right? You have a source, you have, you know, the sinks and how they get destroyed, how they get enhanced. So all these individual terms represents accretion, coagulation, shattering, each of the processes that I just described. And they also produce proportionally to the staff mentioned there. Okay. So, so uh, that's a simple method that we thought we should try to implement in our simulation first. And that's what we did. And it, it works actually pretty well. Um, it's very light computationally. And that was one of the issues in the beginning that the full model was too heavy to be implemented in the cosmological simulation. That's why we wanted to go lighter. So uh, uh, it's a very light modeling. And the growth and evolution is typically described in this type of diagram. So this is a dust to gas ratio. How much dust you have relative to the gas is one quantity called D. Uh, and on the right x-axis, it's a metallicity. So as the system evolves, this is like a closed box system that you have in your head. It's a, a simple system. And as the gas is consumed into, into stars, the metal metallicity increases, right? So the, the arrow, time of arrow goes to the right, okay? So as, as time goes on, it goes to the right. And uh, initially you, you produce this dust uh, in the stars, by the stars. And then at some point, um, uh, there's a nonlinear growth phase. And that's the key feature of these models. 
somewhere around right around uh, past uh, 0.1 solar metallicity. And this goes into a nonlinear growth phase where the uh, um, 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 the grains actually start to grow uh, very rapidly, okay, through accretion of, of the uh, physical process that I just mentioned. So, uh, and this uh, here, this is a distribution of grains as a function of the grain radius. So this is a large grain peak and a small grain peak. Okay, At earlier time when the metal is low, you produce a large grain first. So there's, there's less small grains over here on the left. Okay, so initially this large grain exists over here. And then these large grain gets shattered. So uh, by the shattering, this uh, large grain gets converted into small grains. So these small grains start to rise. So it becomes a hump like this. Okay. And then uh, small grain accretes more, you know, they all accrete. And then uh, because small grains have larger number, so they are actually more favorable to accrete more gas, the gaseous metallicity. So they grow, uh, they help to grow. So this entire, it grows and the coagulation will bring the small grains back into larger grains. And those the processes contribute to the evolution of the extinction curves. And this is how, it, how where, where it relates to the observation, right? Observation, observe the galaxies and how, they, how the light be extinct. So this is the so-called extinction curve as a function of wavelength inverse. So these are the shorter wavelength and this is the large, uh, long wavelength. And so as the larger grains get converted, shattered into smaller grains, the smaller grains will go into, uh, uh, um, um, yeah, smaller grains will contribute to shorter uh, wavelength uh, extension more. So therefore this part of the extension curve start to rise and that makes this extension curve steeper as the smaller grains increase in number. Okay? So those are the typical evolution that we can actually examine through these modeling. So we implemented this into a code, uh, SPH code with these two size approximations. So, so here you see these uh, in the Agora isolated galaxy, you see these large grains first uh, forming uh, preferentially, there's not much uh, small grain, right? And as this large grain uh, increases, this, this large grain gets shattered and the, so the small grains start to increase as time goes on. And then this uh, uh, accretion grows uh, uh, the, the grains and then the small grains get shattered, uh, sorry, coagulate and then also produce the larger grains later on. So this type of evolution uh, can be examined. And we looked at this dust to gas ratio evolution and that is also agreeing with observation. And uh, there are many observed galaxies on this diagram, the dust to gas ratio as a function of metallicity. And there are two limiting cases where this is the first yield uh, line over here, the initial formation. And then as the metallicity increases from 0.1 giga year to 0.3 giga year, it propagates all the way to this uh, on the right-hand side as it, it climbs up this uh, metallicity ladder. And then when the nonlinear evolution kicks in, this jumps like this to the saturation level. Uh, all the metals gets, uh, so all the gas gets converted into metals and that's this upper limit. And so at the, eventually after a few billion years, uh, there's uh, many, much of the metals are also lying along the saturation limit over here. So this type of broad distribution of dust to gas ratio uh, has been reproduced by this very simple uh, two size approximation and also as well as this uh, finer bins. So later we expanded the same treatment with increasing the uh, uh, grain size bin to 32 bins and got more uh, crisp and accurate results relative to the two sides of, of uh, approximation. But overall, this qualitative feature was well captured by the two sides evolution. So we were very happy to see this consistency. Okay. Yeah, so this is the same thing I just mentioned earlier. Uh, I probably don't have to repeat this. Large grains are formed first over here. And then shattering will bring this large grain to small grains. Small grain grows with accretion. And then coagulation pushes this back into larger size. So this uh, relative uh, uh, distribution, this is a distribution function of grains. And um, uh, so that's, that's uh, relative height may change over time. So this evolution contributes to the change in the extension curve. And we are able to reproduce this and examine this uh, variance of extension curve as a function of you know, for example, radius from the center of the galaxy or as function of metallicity 
or function of uh, dense regions versus diffuse regions and compare to more with the observations. And here I, I have the same result of the extension curve. So maybe I'll stop and not mention that. And there are data that's coming out. So uh, uh, Monica Relano took our data and compared to her uh, recent observations of these uh, data of small to large grain relative uh, distribution as a function of radius. In fact, for some of the galaxies, these data points can be observed and then compared. And because you know our simulated galaxy doesn't have the exact same property as observed candidates, so we, we don't get the exact agreement, but uh, through this comparison of small grain to large grain ratio, for example, we can try to understand uh, which process like accretion and coagulation uh, may dominate in these systems. And uh, these data are becoming available uh, from recent nearby galaxy surveys, and it'll, it'll be interesting to learn more about these systems. Okay, this is just the beginning. Okay, so we also looked at uh, cosmology. Uh, we implement the same model to cosmological simulation, although very crude initial uh, 50 megaparsec box, but we saw the cosmological distribution of dust also as, as uh, proceeds as expected. You first form large grains on the left, and then the small grains later follow through those processes uh, as galaxies evolve in these uh, uh, filamentary structures. And that we can look at the dust mass uh, function evolution, um, see how the, the cosmological sample of a galaxy will evolve uh, on this uh, uh, dust to gas ratio plane, for example. Um, those results uh, are, is published some of, some of these papers with our students. Okay. Um, cosmological evolution of dust, omega dust actually been estimated through different means. Um, like correlating that to MG2 absorbers. Um, uh, this Bryce Menard has some papers uh, estimating this uh, cosmological uh, evolution of dust distribution as a function of both redshift and radius from galaxies. And we kind of can sandwich uh, these observed estimates. Uh, both theory and observation still very uncertain in many parameters, but we roughly get the ballpark uh, within, within the uncertainties, I think. So these are uh, encouraging results, not, not so accurate, but um, here on the left is RC result, cosmological simulation, on the right is the McKinnon result. The illustrious results was a bit lower than the observed data points, uh, whereas we, we kind of sandwich different, different results with different environments. Okay, so um, uh, almost end. Uh, here's a, a just a showcasing this McKinnon result and the Granato zooming simulation. So this can be done in cosmological zooming simulation with higher resolution. So we also intend to do that in maybe this year with our next generation of uh, implementation and try to understand more detail with higher resolution simulations, hopefully. Okay. All right, so uh, uh, here's my summary. And um, I hope I convey to you that HiZ Galaxy is a good testing lab of Lambda CDM paradigm. Um, there's an interesting interplay between star formation, cold flow, multi-phase outflow. So it is uh, one of the focus of our current study. Extended uh, line profiles of these emission lines, C2, Lyman alpha, H alpha. Line profiles, all very interesting to prove the stronger, uh, strong cold outflow. Maybe we lack uh, these uh, strong out cold outflow at this point. Maybe our kinetic feedback treatment or thermal instability. Uh, maybe we need cosmic ray uh, feedback in addition to what we have now. Um, and then the later part I talked about dust, which is also interesting and rapidly maturing field. And uh, today I don't have the time to talk about Lyman Alpha Forest, IGM tomography. This is also uh, giving us interesting hints on chemical enrichment on the CGM IGM environment. So probing neutral hydrogen together with metals will be interesting and uh, uh, kind of intensity mapping is becoming also popular and that's one of the uh, focus science with uh, Sodora PSF. So that's one another topic that, that um, uh, we can also study and focus on. Yeah, so thank you very much and I can take more questions. Great, uh, thank you a lot Kentaro and uh... We will invite you in the future to present also this uh, work uh, with the Lyman Alpha Forest uh, yeah. if, you, if you are available <laughs> in the future. Mm -hmm.
Uh, I have a couple of questions, but uh, we will give the opportunity first to the audience, if somebody mm -hmm. in the audience uh, wants. Um, I allowed all of you to uh, unmute yourself, so please uh, go on if you have uh, any question. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Almudena Prieto. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a, a basic question about the dust. And mm -hmm. uh, you you are trying to simulate uh, high redshift, redshift 6 right. or higher. Yes. Yes. And as you mentioned, the problem is where this dust come from, because right. at right. this redshift, we don't have time to produce it. Right. Um, so... Um, how do you put in your simulation? Because you get your coal gas, everything gets in, and somehow you get with your CO. So presumably it's from stars, but we know that of those ratios, there is no enough time to produce the dust. So how do you put it? Um, how do we put it? Well, we form stars in a galaxy in a simulation. So it all comes from star formation activity. And that's the only source we, we have in our calculation. So given that, uh, maybe I didn't include my slide, but of course uh, that's an interesting aspect. And uh, we were also, we, we haven't addressed it very carefully yet, the higher redshift part in particular, but you see up to redshift three or so, we, we are able to um, you know, produce this uh, omega dust so far. So the, the star formation that we have in our simulation is quite in, in enough to uh, produce this dust at, at, this, uh, at this redshift, okay? And then uh, there's another question of like dust amount in rest of six or so. And that's also um, uh, additional uh, interesting part, right? So here, oops, I can't show this. I need to unlock it. Um, here is one, uh, some of the plots for that, uh, answering that. And we here we're showing evolution of um, a dust uh, along this uh, dust to gas ratio from rest of seven to six or so. So th those are still, on this track of the initial yield because they haven't had time to go into this nonlinear phase yet. But for the very massive systems already, which have 10 to the nine to 10 to the 10 solar mass of stars, they've already had sufficient amount of star formation to produce uh, 10 to seven, 10 to the eight solar mass of stars um, in these modeling. So they all come from star formation. I think lower mass systems, we don't know so much yet because these are tip of the iceberg that's been observed, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, my understanding was that this, uh, the dust mostly produced by stars, I suppose is how you produce, as you said, uh, those redshift uh, AGB stars are uh, not ah, yet. Right, AGB stars maybe yeah. not <laughs> kicking in yet. That's right, AGB stars maybe not kicking in. So these are all supernova uh, origin, yeah. You're right. AGB so stars. They, they produce the bulk of the dust. Is how they produce the bulk of the yeah. It's the factory. Mm -hmm. I think a redshift six and seven supernova yield of uh, is sufficient if you assume the uh, the you know the uh, observed dust to metal ratio is sufficient, uh, mm -hmm. the same as uh, at at this at this redshift, then uh, yeah. These, I think I had another slide that showed the result from oxygen. Maybe it's related, but when you saw the, the ratio between oxygen and carbon at those residues as well, I mean, the carbon also start to peak at those residues. So you have AGB stars already, mm -hmm. I mean, sufficient number of AGB stars to produce a lot of carbon. So I guess they can also produce virus Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, car yeah, carbon we already see, so uh, yes. No, yeah, that uh, is the problem. We see the carbon, but we don't know how to produce it. The problem is how to produce it. But they get it naturally, you know? Like, what is the IMF that you're using in, your, in the simulation? Sorry, St. Peter, you say? Uh, no, these are Chabrier. Okay, Chabrier. Yes. And I'm curious as well that the, that the metallicity that you get already at the dresses is very high. I mean, it rich solar already at the yeah. so, so That's right. right. So what is the peak of the star formation for this, those two minute galaxies? Um, I mean, you, you saw the star formation history there, like with very vast at the beginning, and then, but it didn't seem to be very high. No? I don't remember now the numbers. The numbers. Right. They they go up to 10 solar masses per year, rest of Okay, yeah, that's what you say. Okay, 10 yeah. solar masses per year. Okay, so that's the peak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we have uh, another question by Daniel Sevenio that has uh, raised uh, his hand. So, Daniel, if you... Hi, Kentaro. Very nice. Hi. Uh, just Thanks. a follow-up question of this uh, dynamical treatment of that. That is really very mm -hmm. interesting, especially for high reggie, but you don't have enough time. Right. Uh, so if you, st you start with, uh, let's say, a flat attenuation curve, how, how much time uh, on which time scale uh, the um, how much time is needed to uh, um, recreate a cassetti like a steep attenuation log? Mm. Um, looking at this, we have a, this is not a cosmological result, and uh, I forgot, I, I'm not sure, I don't think how I have the attenuation curve result from the cosmological simulation here. Mm. Uh, we have in one of the papers, but uh, the cosmology, of course, is not as high resolution, as you know, for the to look at the details. So uh, I only have this uh, um, isolated galaxy result. But after a uh, uh, billion year, it starts to get steeper uh, as you can shatter this uh, large grain to smaller grains, and then it will, it will become steeper um, and, uh, yeah. But what was the question again? So as you wanted to yeah, know about SM, SMC or what? Uh, well, no, if for galaxies are ready six, for example, so one giga year after the Big Bang, uh, oh. we see in observations uh, um, a trend between the the UV slope and the brightness in oh. the UV. Mm -hmm. and, and people saying that that's due to the dust attenuation, that is uh, have more attenuation in more massive uh, galaxies. But if you see in one giga year, there's no, uh, this are basically no reddening, there will be another explanation. Or maybe the, because oh. that was a very uh, 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 isolated galaxy, right? So all the right. supernova actually uh, um, are producing the same environment, typical environment. In maybe in a cosmological simulation, the result is different because you have different environments. Right, right, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, th this will be cosmological uh, environment will be very different from this isolated case. So these are ideal uh, environment that we're just examining as an example. Um, but uh, uh, even just after one billion year in this dense region, um, you know, this uh, uh, attenuation curve becomes start to become you know steeper as the small grains increase. Uh, as a large grain gets shattered in this envir dense environment. So these processes is actually starting to kick in and they're starting to attenuate. And this is showing the variance of uh, our attenuation curve, you know, 21, 25 percentile and uh, 75 percentile and Milky Way attenuation curve is already beginning to be covered uh, even just after a billion year. So in principle, um, by rest of six, uh, if these uh, similar environment uh, exists in cosmological galaxy as well, um, uh, these uh, uh, reddening is already becoming to happen, depending on the environment. Okay. Yeah, because but, uh, six, um, the star formation has been happening in galaxies maybe for a few hundred million years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, this is mostly due to uh, grain growth, right? Or the opposite, or spattering. For the global increase of the of the uh, metal mass, that is the the uh, grain growth uh, that's increasing the, the bringing the metal mass uh, up, right? So there's a dust mass up, yeah. So that's the uh, nonlinear accretion that's trying to bring up this uh, uh, metal abundance, uh, dust abundance up, yeah. So as long as that can kick in and to increase the dust mass enough sufficiently by RISU-6, um, then that can, that can actually help. But yeah, it, it, it is dependent on the environment. Yes, as, 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 as this diagram show here in the cosmological case, by RISU-6, it's barely getting into this nonlinear phase you see over here on, the, on this uh, right. This is a RISU-5 and 6, and it's just starting to rise above is uh, getting, getting into nonlinear phase. So if you if you can you know amplify this part depending on the environment, then uh, this may go up depending on certain certain regions. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, we have another question by uh, Loic. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, in the Agora collaboration, we have seen that there is strong differences in shocks between AMR and uh, SPH. I was wondering what you think about your result uh, in um, respect to that. Right. Um, you mean this uh, accretion shock along the filament, right, that we have examined? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of difficult to say at this point because we haven't done further tests on that. But, um, you know, we, we thought, um, uh, we, we, these are uh, updated SPH, right? This the pressure entropy formulation that can uh, treat those uh, uh, interfaces relatively well uh, compared to the old generation of SPH. And uh, we have done uh, improvements uh, to, to uh, account for this, uh, you know, uh, so-called uh, deficiencies of uh, SPH relative to the mesh. So I wonder, um, you know, how the, this hydro difference can account for uh, those differences. Um, but but you that, are using those changes uh, in Agora, right? Oh. That's right. That's right. So we, we are still seeing the shocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, isn't it possible still that uh, our, uh, well, the re re refinement, degree of refinement is also different, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, those differences may also cause difference. And I, it's hard to say which is right at this point, I think. Um, uh, I totally agree. I'm just wondering if your results are more or less independent uh, on the um, type of scheme that you have behind, or mm. if you expect strong differences between AMR and SPH. Mm. Um, I, I cannot conclude just by what we have learned so far. Uh, I think we have more rigorous comparison would be, would be needed to say more. And uh, since this uh, is recorded, I shouldn't say something ambiguous and uh, I'll be stabbed by the, by the mesh simulation community maybe if I say something uh, a bit uh, too drastic, I guess. Oh, <laughs> Danny, no. will come to, Danny will come to Japan and stab me from the back. <laughs> Additionally, I want to add that uh, basically what we see is without any kind of feedback. So probably in these models that you are showing, Kentaro, this effect of these shocks in the in the filaments will not be important because basically here you have a lot of extra heating from uh, from the star mm -hmm. formation. So probably is not a problem. In, in right, right. I mean, the results I've shown today is more or less dominated by the physics uh, that's occurring from the galaxies and the outflows and all those movies I showed earlier is is really not just, uh, you know, not not these are not coming from, you know, this external heating of the shocks. These are really coming from supernova uh, heating, right? Uh, from the star formation. So, yeah. um, so this I think is not affected by those, uh, um, you know, if there is any heating due to the cold, um, that, that's not what's causing this uh, high, high temperature bubbles yeah. coming out. Yeah. Right, thanks. But, but uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but if the models are simple enough to implement, maybe it will be worth it to explore it uh, in Agora. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. so we, we, we should uh, plan to do that in the future and uh, study this more in detail. Yeah, yeah. thank and, you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And what's interesting, I would just add that this outflow looks fairly strong uh, in this movie. So I thought that this uh, outflow is pretty strong, um, trying to simulate uh, you know, chemical enrichment in the circumgalactic environment. But you know, when you compare it within, uh, with our Agora comparison, this model is not the strongest one, in fact, uh, relative to the like Enzo AMR or you know, uh, other, other, other simulations uh, that's doing the feedback differently. So I realized that uh, our feedback, kinetic feedback in particular, is maybe not strong enough in, in, the, in the movies I'm showing here. Although it looks uh, pretty sufficient uh, when you look at like a metal distribution in the circumgalactic environment, this is going pretty far away to circumgalactic space, but um, 
it, 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 we have to actually compare to the um, uh, crazy absorption line studies more in detail and see which is better. Uh, whether we need to carry the metals more into space, like we saw in the carbon two emission uh, profile, um, or this is sufficient. That, that still needs to be answered. And I think those are very good uh, probes to study the feedback more. Yeah, yeah I agree. Okay, so we have, I think Patricia Sanchez Vlasquez also has a question. Or? Well, actually, I, mean, I already did it, but I, but I have another one. Okay. I mean, how, how fast is the mixing of metals in the simulations? I mean, what is the, yeah, what is the prescription for, for mixing the metals or if you said right. Yeah. right, that's a good question. And um, uh, SPH also has a difficulty in treating the metal mixing. And uh, because you know the gas fluid is represented by the particles, so by those particles that, that represent the gas cloud, also retains the metals uh, on its own. Mm -hmm. So the metals don't mix uh, within the cells automatically. And some people implement the metal diffusion mm -hmm. uh, process uh, using uh, subgrid turbulence uh, modeling. And in this particular case uh, show, that I'm showing, we don't have that treatment. Okay. So this is uh, just for visualization purposes and for analysis purposes, we actually smooth over the metal distribution among the nearest neighbor particles as we do for the density calculation in SPH. Okay. So that is treated when we analyze it, not dynamically as we run the simulation. I see, okay, yeah. thank you. So that's a caveat uh, in our calculation. And uh, we, we want to uh, study the metal diffusion also, yeah, in the future too. And that, certainly enhance the more more distribution of metals, but I don't think that's gonna change the global distribution of metals. Mm -hmm. It may change the small scale structure of the metal distribution, um, which promotes maybe the, the metal uh, carrying out you know, into the circumgalactic environment, mm -hmm. but metal diffusion is not gonna account for the intergalactic uh, distribution of metals. Okay. Uh, only by that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the talk as well. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, I have a, a question that maybe I hope it's a short question, and it's mm -hmm. just um, or a, or a suggestion. Um, my, my question is: uh, You have implemented this uh, art to uh, code for the radiative transfer, and also yeah. you computed the, the dust grain formation. Yeah. Uh, and the question is. Uh, is this included somehow self-consistently inside the code? Like if you create uh, more dust, then you absorb more the external, ultra, uh, external radiation mm -hmm. or in the first, right. are you generated some kind of uh, ultraviolet uh, local background source or something like that or not? It's um, just, uh, um, you are just, um, yeah, well, I think I, I explained it uh, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, as you uh, pointed out, yes, uh, it's not coupled yet uh, properly. So this is uh, still post-processing. And because, you know, racing calculate transfer is a uh, relatively heavy calculation, we, we can't couple them at the same time. And uh, of course, in the future, we, we will we will like to couple it and uh, treat them all the, at the same time. But uh, that is not being done yet in, I think, any of the codes that I know of have done everything together. For, for um, example, I, I was wondering if for, from your results about dust, maybe you can extract some very basic uh, function uh, of metallicity and, and time. For example, if you put a flag on the, on the particle uh, on when the metallicity was produced, and then maybe you can assume that if this is as old as that and has this metallicity, then you will have this amount of grains. So maybe you can reduce the the the, the the right. approach, I don't know. It's yeah, just yeah. Idea. yeah. The, the next obvious first step is uh, to, to run this uh, dust, uh, called zooming simulation with the dust formation and, and, and the destruction in, uh, in our hydro. And then again, write, uh, run this R2 consistently with that dust modeling. That is the next obvious step. And then the, uh, the second step would be to couple this uh, resin transfer to the more uh, closely to the dust evolution. But I think we need to come up with a faster radiation transfer uh, natively that can do this in, in uh, SPH. Um, so a REPO can, can maybe start to doing this. There's a REPO RT code, a REPO radiation transfer code. And so 
that RFORT is uh, doing some of that uh, dust evolution uh, calculation. Uh, if, you, if you run the same simulation uh, with the McKinnon model, you can do this RFORT with uh, coupled with dust, but I think it's not perfectly done yet. And uh, McKinnon treatment of dust is uh, 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 less intricate than what we're doing in, in our dust uh, formation evolution. So. Uh, they, they need to upgrade their dust modeling and then fully couple through the radiation transfer more. Uh, so that needs to be done further. Um, okay, thank you a lot for, for the effort. And, and I think we are we're running out of time. So uh, <laughs> if somebody else has uh, some other question, uh, maybe you can just uh, 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 write uh, ah! after. Uh, well, maybe I have, I think lady, lady you have a question maybe? Um, yeah, yes, I wanted to okay. ask something okay. about the DAS model, but okay. if uh, we are out of time, I will just... No, no, you, you can, the DAS question. Oh. <laughs> looks oh, like it, your dog, it looks like your dog wants to ask your questions too. <laughs> yeah, he's angry now. Um, uh, I've, I've got two questions related with your DAS model. The first one mm -hmm. is uh, about your DAS sizes, because uh -huh. you, you consider two populations and you are always terming them as a large sized yeah. and small sized. But yeah. I've seen that your large dust particles are of 0.1 micron size. That's right. That, that's, that's where the peak large. is. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not right. large. Well, that, that's large, but um, um, oh. your small dust particles are like almost uh, at, uh, so small that they could be molecules. Um, I think because uh, they, are ha they have sizes of more or less, um, I can't see it very well, but it was like uh, 10 nanometers. Yeah, and, okay. Yeah, and, uh, maybe this one's better. I don't know. Yeah, so yeah, more or less. I think so. Uh, 10 nanometers is where? Uh, 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 in the small, in the small um, yeah, range. This one over here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, well, more or less, uh, because this when is I've... 10 nanometers over here, I think. Okay, so you're considering, uh, no, that's one nanometer, in fact. It's one nanometer. Uh, this, ten, this is 10 nanometer, yeah. So you're, you're considering a very, very small dust grains in all the simulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other question is, um, how did you treat the composition of dust? Ah, that's right. Oh, that's a good question, too. And uh, we have basically two types uh, representing. One is the carbonaceous and the other is silicates. And uh, those modeling has also been done, uh, trying to separate the evolution of the two. Um, and uh, that also obviously affects the uh, extinction curve. And so um, initially we were doing with only uh, carbonaceous one, I think, if I yes. remember correctly. And then later we wanted to consider this uh, bump uh, more carefully. So uh, we, we considered both cases and uh, uh, the paper you saw by Ho et al is actually the one you, the one where we did that. And uh, maybe I didn't include that slide here. But uh, yeah, one of the, uh, Quan Cho Ho was a hero's uh, student, PhD student who did this calculation. And he, he has one paper on the details of extension curve evolution uh, separating both, considering both carbonaceous and uh, silicate type grains. When you say carbonaceous, and, uh, you're considering graphite and PAHs or only graphites? Uh, not, not the PAHs, not the PAHs, only the grains, yeah. Only gra yeah. okay. Yeah. So yeah, those are, uh, there will be, there are of course additional uh, small scale processes we need to consider uh, like a species of grains. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you a lot, Kentaro, for, for this uh, very good talk and also for accepting our invitation to be here in the Parker Seminars. Mm -hmm. And yeah. well, hope to see you uh, in the future with more, more yeah. results. Yeah. This is one of the virtues of uh, being in uh, COVID era where yeah. we can have seminars uh, ac across the globe, I guess, yes. Although timing is usually difficult also. <laughs> but, right, right. Yes. as long as the time difference works out, yes. Yeah. Okay, so thank you a lot. Thank you everybody for coming. And I invite you to come to next week, also on Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning, Central European time. Uh, we will have Mercer Romero Gomez talking about uh, uh, formation of spiral arms and also data, data from, from the Gaia satellite. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. Thank okay. you again now and see thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much. See you in person someday. Yeah.